Today, I'm going to be doing another podcast recording session with one of my favorite guests. And without further ado, I just want to introduce you to him because he's a fantastic guy. It's the lovely, the inimitable Jay Bear, also known, interestingly enough, as Tequila Jay on certain social media networks, which we will be talking about because I'm so fascinated about it. But just getting into the podcast, I want to say thank you for joining us, Jay, and ask you this very interesting question. When did you decide to pivot Jay Bear to Tequila Jay and really focus on this, what I would consider almost a new chapter in your life? Great to see you again, DP. Thanks for having me. I wouldn't use the word pivot necessarily. I would use the word parallel because I am as busy this year as a speaker, author, consultant than I've ever been. Uh, it's just that I've added tequila kind of as a as a uh, frosting on top of the cake. So it's not as if I'm not doing my regular job. I'm doing my regular job and now a tequila job as well. But I've been interested in agave spirits for some 25 years. When I sold my consulting firm a couple of years ago, I had through the totality of that journey hosted a weekly podcast called Social Pros. And when I got off the Social Pros microphone, DP, I said, you know, I've been spending a few hours a week doing this show. Maybe I should take that time that I'd compartmentalized for podcast hosting and just try to teach people some of the things that I've learned about tequila and agave spirits over the last few decades. And I'd never really made short form content. I've made a lot of long form content in my career, but not a lot of short form content. So I said, well, that'd be fun to experiment with. I Instagram reels and TikTok, cause I don't know much about that. And so we did fast forward a little over a year and, and here we are with uh, hundreds of thousands of viewers on, on our tequila content and brand sponsors and all kinds of crazy stuff. Let me tell you, I'm a follower of Tequila J on TikTok, and you know, I kind of stumbled upon you, and I went, "Oh man, this is cool." And when I, of course, invited you on the podcast, one of the things I do is I try to go down that that TikTok, you know, the little thumbnails of all the videos you've done, yes. and I've seen many of them. But one thing caught my attention and almost made my jaw fall off my head, and that is one of your TikTok has received. 2.6 million views. It has yep. been loved by 157,000 people. It's been bookmarked by 40.9 thousand people and commented on by 1,898 people as of this morning. And that blew me away. So when you say that, oh, I had a couple hours left in my week and I thought I could probably fill it with something easy, kind of not even a side hustle, but maybe a a side back scratch, I don't know, a side, <laughs> exactly. you know, just something minimal. And it gets 2.6 million views and that type of engagement and really establishes you, whether you like it or not, and I know you like it, as one of the authorities, especially about tequila on TikTok, which happens to be going out to probably some of the most enthusiastic drinkers of tequilas and agave spirits. Yeah. This is amazing to me. And I want to let viewers of the live stream see exactly what I'm talking about by sharing that 2.6 million oh, view thing. Go. And it's all courtesy of, I think, George Clooney. And we'll talk about that in a second. One of the things I want to point out is he's not wearing one of his trademark plaid suits. We'll talk about that. But let's just watch this for a second so you can see exactly what's what I'm talking about and so enthusiastic about. A lot of people love Casamigos tequila, and I get it. You can find it almost everywhere. George Clooney helped start the brand. Like I understand why people like it, but it is a tequila. The number one flavor note on all the reviews for Casamigos, even on the Blanco, is vanilla. And I'm here to tell you that tequila made without artificial flavoring is not supposed to taste like vanilla, especially a Blanco it's been in a barrel for a year or three years or five years, yeah, you can get vanilla flavoring. But for a Blanco that's not... Okay, I want to stop it there because hopefully listeners have gone, oh, that's interesting. I want to pull out one of the great copywriting lines in there. It's a tequila. Yep. Love that because you you formed the concept in a bumper sticker and made it memorable. And I guarantee you that's why a lot of people said, oh, you got my attention. I was drinking Casamigos because I thought it was kind of the tequila or one of the top tequilas. You're telling me it's a lie? Tell me more. So yeah, I, actually, I was fascinated by that. That, that, tequila, that, that sort of term of art, tequila, I, I created that. That was not the first video I used it in, but I used it prior to that. 
But even now, and that's it's been a bit since that one came out, I, people parrot that line back to me all the time. They, you know, they they ask me in the comments, "Is this a tequila lie?" Etc. So I, I sort of I need to make shirts with a tequila. Uh, I do have a whole merch store, but but I don't have a tequila shirt, and that reminds me that I should make one. So I appreciate that. Oh yeah, you absolutely need to because just like other TikTokers have really created their own street language that is uniquely yeah. theirs. I'm thinking yes, about it's, well, actually one of the great. It's actually one of the success equations, right? If you if you look at like what Pat Flynn talks about in his book, this idea of creating a name for the audience and then and then either a signature kind of words or segments or bits that you do in all of your videos, it creates a sense of community that propels the community forward. And and it's funny you you, you mentioned that we're actually actively working on adding some more of that to, to our videos. One of the things that I, I think is so powerful about that is not the, not just the very handy coining of a phrase, but the intent behind it, which is, I want to help you get the greatest agave spirit tequila experience you can and one of the things you need to understand is some of the stuff being served to you is not actually tequila so it's fine if you like it i'm not saying don't drink it if you love the flavor and some of the comments are like i like it because it tastes like vanilla great go for it but if you think you're a fine connoisseur of the top shelf tequila let me disabuse you of that notion or better yet educate you not only yep. intellectually, but ideally through your palate as well on what constitutes a great tequila. And that is one of the brand pillars of Tequila J. And yeah, I, I love you is, for doing um, that. Thank you. We, we, what we say now a lot of times is, you know, drink what you like, but know what you're drinking. Yeah. Because that, that way, if you've got all the information and you understand how many tequilas, especially the popular ones, are falsified with chemicals and and fake vanilla and fake agave syrups and even fake coloring to make them look darker and older there's there's a lot of shenanigans and 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 if you know kind of the truth about the shenanigans and you're still like hey man i i just like it cuz it tastes like pancake syrup and that's kind of my jam cool you you do you but i, I just want to make sure you kind of know what's up before you just randomly say that casamigos is the best tequila even though it's not it's interesting too because there are wine has long had connoisseurs and sommeliers and the, yep. the what are they the the chevalier de Tostevon or whatever the, <laughs> exactly. the the crazy guys who do the incredible yep. test to get the to become a knight of yeah. wine essentially yep. tequila has always been fairly popular but I, I see it as getting increasingly popular am I right in my understanding of that. 40 or zero percent growth in sales in the U.S. in two years. Wow. So you really jumped on a thoroughbred horse that's really starting to break the, from the pack. And at least from my point of view, you're leading the pack when it comes to authorities that I can trust, I find interesting. And I got to tell you, the, the short form video format is perfect for the, the little tidbits that you put out so. there. Yeah, we've certainly thought about doing longer form YouTube videos and things along those lines. We haven't tackled that yet. It's more of a production question than it is a being able to do it question. And, and look, I, I am by no means the authority on tequila. There are innumerable people who know way more than, than I will ever know. My role is to be the translator between super nerds and, and real people. I, I'm not trying to be the authority. I am trying to be someone who is approachable and knowledgeable enough to take a novice or intermediate tequila fan and kind of bring them up the ladder a couple of steps. And and some of that is just because that's where my own knowledge base is and, and where I'm comfortable, but also it's just math. I think you'll appreciate this, DP. So approximately 40 million Americans have had at least one cocktail with tequila in the last month or so. Mostly margaritas, palomas, increasingly ranch waters, but if you think of it from a marketing standpoint, the total addressable audience of people who would even conceivably want to watch a video about tequila in the U.S. is 40 million people max. Within that group, there are people who are true aficionados, like myself. The app that we use, and we actually showed it in that video clip that you inserted, is called Tequila Matchmaker. So it's similar to the Wine.com Vivino app. It's similar to Untapped for Beer, etc. It's where you can go to to rate and rank and learn about all the different tequilas. There are 270,000 people who have downloaded that app ever. Think this through. 40 million, 
270,000. When I first started making tequila videos, my observation was that there were a number of other people creating tequila content, but it was almost exclusively aficionados creating content for aficionados. And I love that kind of content, but there's not a, as big of an audience there. So we very purposely, when we started this program, said, let's communicate to the people who just know enough to order a margarita and kind of walk them up the knowledge scale as opposed to starting here and hoping that you can take those people up another notch. And so that's kind of been been our success. And, and we try to not overcomplicate it uh, as much as we can. This is where I tie everything back to the central premise of this podcast when it comes to personal and small business branding. You are not being an expert that only talks to the rarefied air of the few people who are uber, as you use the word, nerds about this stuff. You are doing the same thing Susie Orman has done for personal finance, the same thing Neil deGrasse Tyson has done for astronomy and science, you know, even into the realms of physics and stuff like that, the same thing that Bill Nye has done for science. You have decided to exist in that big middle market, if you will. It's, it's not quite a middle market per se, you know, according to the business term, but it's that big middle area where you got to have a little bit of interest in it so that I can talk to you about this, but you don't have to have a lot of knowledge because that's what I'm going to share with you. And guess where the, I hate to say it, guess where a lot of the money lies. It's not in the, let me put it this way, College professors who study the very nichiest of niches may be the expert on any given thing. And that, well, like even Einstein, it was said that when he came out with his general theory of relativity, there were three people in the world who actually understood it. <laughs> well, guess what? A whole lot of other people existed in that middle area to popularize the idea, to explain it in such a way that other people could get it. And frankly, they sold a whole lot more content via books or became experts on TV, TV shows, et cetera, than the person who actually originated it. So how does this relate to the average listener of this podcast? Be a J, which is you don't have to wait until you are the expert to start sharing your knowledge, your experience and expertise. You can get out there in bite-sized pieces and share that and prove demonstrate your authority, and guess what happens? People then consider you an authority. Maybe not the authority, but the same way I don't consider Susie Orman the authority on personal finance. But if I had a, I don't know, a, a, a get together where I live and Susie Orman was coming to speak, I have no doubt that place would be packed to the rafters because everyone knows, oh, she's relatable. Do you see how that works? It's that old thing about a guide is not 15 miles in front of you. They're five feet in front of you. And they guide you further down that path. They know more than you, yes. But it, it's not like they have a PhD in whatever it is over what you know. And that's what I love about what you're doing with Maddie, your co-host on TikTok. What I always keep in mind is something that my good friend Rory Vaden taught me, and Rory's a, an extraordinary personal branding consultant and strategist. He says, your ideal audience is the person that you used to be. And what I try and keep in mind is that there was a point in time that I didn't know anything about tequila. And if I can remember that version of me and create content for that version of me and not get besotten by the curse of expertise, then we will continue to be successful. And Maddie, my co-host who you mentioned, who's on most of the videos, she's actually my assistant for all my businesses, the tequila business, the speaking business, the consulting business. So I work with her every day. The reason I brought her on to the videos, number one, she's just has a great camera presence. We have a really good dynamic, but she is the audience, right? She is sort of the manifestation of who we're trying to reach, where when we started doing the videos, she knew very, very little about tequila other than she loved margaritas. That was like the base level. And now over a year, year and a half, like she's at the point now where she really knows what's up. And so it's been a really interesting journey for her personally and for me to have sort of a, a shotgun seat to, to watch that transformation. And what I really love DP is when the audience comments and says, wow, I can't believe like how much better Maddie's tasting notes have gotten 
or they say, oh, I really prefer the tequilas that Maddie likes, not the tequilas that Jay likes, et cetera. When they're sort of picking up what we're putting down in that way, that's, that's really, really gratifying. You know you're having an impact. For those of us old enough to remember the good old days of at the movies with Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, yeah, exactly. I had I had R. a R. rule of thumb. I one, I was a kid in high school watching this thing like and drinking it like water because yeah, I, I loved film, but I didn't have the language. You know, I didn't really understand. I knew that this one was better than this one, but I couldn't tell you why. And, and so you've got these two opinionated experts who would they didn't dumb it down. They just made it accessible. And over time you went, you know what? And this was my rule of thumb. If they both like it, I'm going to go see it. If Gene yeah. Siskel hates it and Roger loves it, I'm going to go see it. If Gene Siskel loves it and Roger hates it, I'm not going to go see it. Because literally <laughs> I understood that my taste was more aligned with that of Roger Ebert than Gene yeah. Siskel. The same way that perhaps, and I'm going to guess, and I don't mean to be sexist or anything like that i'm going to guess that a lot of the females in your audience really appreciate having someone they see as themselves as a, truly a surrogate for themselves discovering and finding the joy of having a little bit of knowledge it's not just about oh i like margaritas it's i really like the tasting notes difference between this specific and so that when someone says what type of tequila would you like in the margarita if, if you're at a place that actually doesn't just pull the the yeah. you know the what is, what is it called the, the well drink the well yeah, yeah. The well drink yep they actually ask you what type of brand and you can legitimately say well actually do you have Don Julio oh yes we do mm, oh <laughs> exactly there's exactly. almost a, a dopamine release of yes I've impressed myself and others so that's a <laughs> yeah. good thing. When Maddie's out with her friends now, they always make her do tastings and, and like, you know, walk her, walk them through stuff at the, at the bar or the nightclub. And she's at the stage of her life where she's going to weddings like every weekend almost. I think she's done like 12 weddings this year so far. So she's now the, the wedding tequila expert, which is pretty fantastic. But I got to tell you something that, that you'll appreciate. You know, I've been in B2B content creation for, you know, 20 plus years, right? Whether it's writing books or podcasts or speaking or uh, had a very successful blog for a number of years and a YouTube channel and the whole thing. And it's been it's been successful in the in a B2B context. But when you do B2C content, it's a really different deal. An event a couple of days ago in Denver, and I'm parking the car and I give the car to the valet, your tequila J Bear, right? This is the this is the valet parking the car for the speech I'm gonna give about business. And he only cares about tequila J Bear. I was in a hotel two weeks prior in uh, St. Louis. And I'm just walking down the hallway to the ice machine and a guy walks past me and kind of as he's past me, he sort of mumbles, that looks like Tequila J Bear. And I whip around. I'm like, I am Tequila J Bear, right? And the whole thing, I gave him a pin and a sticker. And the, so it happens all the time. So I get recognized at least once a week for tequila. A, a 20 plus year career as a best-selling author, a Hall of Fame speaker, nobody gives a shit. But you start making tequila videos for a year and all of a sudden you're famous. Let me tell you. That's exactly what happens when you put yourself out there and you start building a truly personal, personal brand. I mean, Jay Bear, and we'll talk about Jay Bear, the keynote speaking juggernaut in next week's episode. I want to focus this week on Tequila Jay, the tequila educator that I know primarily from TikTok. But uh, I think you said you also put it on Instagram Reels. Yeah, we actually have a larger audience on, on Reels. It's, that, that's always a weird dynamic. Some videos work better on TikTok. Some work better on Instagram. We do the same videos in both places. We probably shouldn't. We should probably tailor them a little bit more for each channel. But I only want to put so much time into this. But yeah, our, our audience is bigger on, on Instagram for us. That is interesting to me. But the whole point is one piece of content goes two places and yep. it would, it's more than a 2x multiply when it comes to audience, because if you're saying TikTok is X and Instagram is X plus 10, that's more than 2x. I, I, I wasn't good at math, and I even know that. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, the, 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 the overlap between those two platforms is very minimal, especially for reels. You know, Instagram photos or Instagram carousels, you might have some people consume that and TikTok because then it's a different format. But short form video on Instagram, short form video on TikTok, most people kind of pick one. But for reasons that I don't fully understand, frankly, we started off when we started this project stronger on TikTok. 
then over time, we got less strong on TikTok and a lot stronger on Instagram. So now Instagram, we consider to be sort of our primary home and TikTok is our secondary home. Day to day, we have quite a bit more audience on, on Instagram. The, the average video for us on Instagram will do 25,000 views a day. On average, uh, TikTok is lower, but the TikTok algorithm is tuned such that if you do have a breakout post like the one we looked at earlier, your options, the chances that you'll have a huge spike are bigger on TikTok than on Instagram. So Instagram's got a, a higher sort of floor, at least for us. TikTok has a higher ceiling, at least for us. That's very interesting. But I want to underline the weight of the bar you have to lift to do what you've done so successfully. Five videos a week. How long does it take you to produce one of those? And typically, what's the typical length? We try to keep every video, we have a few exceptions, but we try to have every video under 90 seconds. So usually our videos are 80 to 88 seconds, somewhere in that ballpark. Rarely longer, occasionally shorter. Frankly, I would love to be able to get them under 60. If we get them under 60, then we could do them with YouTube shorts as well, because the, the cutoff for shorts on YouTube is 60 seconds. I just, it's been, it's too hard. I can't, I, we, we can't talk about the topic enough in 60 seconds to, to deliver as much value as I'd like to the audience. So we haven't been able to get it under 60 consistently, but the way we do it, when it's just me on camera, I'll actually shoot them right here in the home studio, usually on Saturdays when I'm not speaking and I'll knock out two or three in a row. When we have Maddie with me, which is most of the videos are both of us. The way it works is Maddie doesn't live in town anymore. She used to live here in Bloomington, Indiana, where I live. Now she lives up north in Indianapolis. She'll come down about every three weeks and we'll have it very planned out and we'll shoot out like nine or 10 videos in a row. So it's a long, it's a pretty long day. It's usually a, you know, an hour to set up and then three hours to shoot. So four hours there to shoot them. And then I do the, the rough edits, the slam edits. So I'll take, usually when we record the video, the actual recording is about two and a half minutes, something like that. I'll take the two and a half minute clip, drop it into an online program and just kind of cut out because I know I want it under 90. Be like, yeah, that's interesting. We can put it in the caption. That's interesting. We can put it in the caption and I'll get the timing approximate. And then now I used to edit them all myself, DP. Yeah. But I was like, all right, this is, I can't like this, this is too much time. So now we use a, a company called Splashio, which does the, the actual edits and the captions and the cutaways and stuff. And they're really inexpensive and, and very responsive. So we like working with them a lot. So I upload all the rough edits to Splashio. They do all the final edits. And then Maddie's in charge of actually posting the content every day to Instagram and TikTok. So I would say it probably takes us all in. It's about, it's about an hour of video, I would say, by the time you add everything up which is not bad. And, and, and it's much shorter than most people, but I've also been making episodic content on a weekly basis for 20 plus years. So I am naturally faster at that kind of getting it into a system than, than most people would be. My understanding based on how well, just watching your content, there's not a hard script. There's not a teleprompter, is no, there? No, never, no. Okay, so you've no. got kind of talking points and then you just go. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that was the one I'm very comf comfort comfortable with that style, having done, you know, a thousand podcasts, et cetera. I wasn't sure when we started whether Maddie could do that. And it turns out she very easily can. I mean, she's a natural on camera. So it's, it's actually worked out great. It would be a lot less interesting content if it was totally scripted and, and promptered and all that. So pretty much we have a topic, we kind of know where we're trying to get to, and then we just talk it out and, and, and make it work in the edit. Take that as a lesson. All you people who are like, I have to have a script. I have to say it exactly as written. I have to sweat as I look into the camera. And uh, I, uh, uh, I'm telling you, the authenticity of I know this stuff. I might even hammer haw a little bit in here. The you know, I'm not going for newscast or smooth. I'm going for hey, this is me. I have some important stuff I want to share with you, and boom. That's what people want. That's what people respond to. And frankly, that's what people can smell. They can smell when yeah. you're too practiced or when you're doing the eye dart thing where you're moving your yeah. eyes and that's just terrible. It Especially TikTok, Instagram. I mean, that, that level of imperfection actually creates an authenticity bond with the audience. Content that's too polished typically doesn't work well in that format. So here's, here's my actual advice on that, DP, if I may. Yeah. Go ahead and script it. 
but here's how you do it. Write the script, read the script silently, then perform the script, then delete the script, turn on your camera and do it. You read it once, you say it once, then delete it, then turn on the camera and do it. You'll have enough like short-term memory in your head that it won't be a train wreck, but it won't feel scripted because it's not totally scripted at that point. That's, that's the process that I really recommend. Write it, read it, say it, delete it. And the delete it is to me the most important thing because if you have the notes right below you, you are okay. going to look. Even if you yep. don't need to, you will look at them because you're like, Absolutely. did I leave anything out? And the second you break eye contact with the camera, that's when you become that kind of shifty eyed, you know, they call it shifty eyed. <laughs> exactly. Shifty eyed was originally describing people you know are lying to you or snake right. oil salesmen. Right. right. Well, now when it comes to doing what we're doing right now, I'm staring right into the camera lens. You are down here, but I'm not looking at you. I'm looking right into the camera lens because I know my eye contact is going into your eyes. It's kind of the exactly. Errol Morris style of interviewing for documentaries. Okay. He has this whole mirrored setup so he can literally look straight in the eye of the person he's interviewing and the camera will capture that eye line. And that is so important when it comes to authenticity. But again, I just wanna underline it for listeners. You don't have to be this monster practice actor to do this stuff. You gotta go see, I'm gonna pull up the, the one shot with the lower third so you can actually see it. Go follow tequila.j on TikTok or Instagram. Is it still tequila.j on Instagram? Uh, tequila J Bear. Tequila J Bear on Instagram. Okay. So either place, go check him out and you will see this guy who's very personable. And I'm not going to say you have a face for radio or anything like that, but you're a normal guy. I'm a normal guy. Yeah. You're a normal guy and you're, you're sharing what you know. You aren't afraid to, to make a pronouncement that this is a tequila lie, which is, by the way, you got to have that merch. You got to. It's like Dan McClellan on TikTok, who is a, a Bible scholar who has been on the podcast. He always starts his videos when someone is coming out with an extraordinary claim. He'll do, cut to him and he'll go, all right, let's see it. And now he's got, all right, let's see it, <laughs> T-shirts. And people love him for that. It's a, it's a catchphrase, but it's based not on, I need a catchphrase, but I said right. this over and over Actually. again. And yep. it, it's an organic thing now associated with me. So anybody listening, anybody watching the live stream should recognize the fact that Jay Bear is just a fountain of fantastic information about doing stuff. Not the least of which is taking a side hustle and turning it into something incredibly wonderful to the point that dude is recognized in the hallway of a hotel. That's, per <laughs> that's, that's personal branding at its best. And, but that's not all that Jay is. He's a whole lot more. In fact, he's a New York Times bestselling author of Talk Triggers and other books. You need to check those out. You can find those all at jbear.com. You can find out everything he's doing, including a brand new book called The Time to Win, which has an incredible selling concept that I want to talk about in next week's episode. But for now, I want to remind everybody that this podcast is brought to you by this bad boy, bum, 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 nonfiction brand, Discover, Craft, and Communicate, the completely true, completely you brand you already are, written by yours truly. But here's the thing. Somebody blurbed the front of the book, and it says this. Three fire emojis. Highly recommended, a spectacularly useful guide to personal branding that pulls off the difficult trick of being both realistic and inspirational. A must read regardless of where you are in your own brand building journey. Who said that? The man you see in front of you, Jay Bear, New York Times bestselling author of Talk Triggers. So once again, thank you so much for blurbing that book and giving me your, that stellar blurb. I mean, I couldn't ask Richly for anything Richly deserved, better. my friend. Richly deserved. It's a great book. Well, thank you so much. That book, by the way, is available at Amazon.com. Just look for nonfiction brand. And maybe tack on the last name Knutin just to make it easier to find. And Knutin is spelled as you see it on the screen. Or if you're listening, it's K-N-U. D as in David, T as in Tom, E as in Edward, N as in nothing. Check it out. I hope you'll pick up a copy and let me know what you think. For now, that's it for this week's edition of the Nonfiction Brand Podcast. I am, of course, your host, D.P. Knutin, and he is... Tequila J. Bear. And we'll be talking at you again next week. Bye-bye.